Spirit. Amen. O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you in the watch. My mouth is filled with your praise. And with your glory all the day. O Lord, open my lips. And my mouth will declare your praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. We just sang our hymn. So today we have our catechism reading. Our catechism reading is from the close of the commandment. So let's read together. What does God say about all these commandments? He says, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Exodus 20, 5 through 6. So what does this mean? God threatens to punish all who break these commandments. Therefore, we should fear his wrath and do not do anything against them. But he promises grace and every blessing to all who keep these commandments. Therefore, we should also love and trust in him and gladly do what he commands. And let us pray. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you, for into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul in all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. We had the Exodus last time we talked about the crossing of the Red Sea, and today we're talking about the Ten Commandments. So uh, we haven't talked used this in a while, but I figured I might as well put it back in. So this is the law and gospel theme for today. Let's read together. We reject God's law as we go on our way, failing to love God and love others before ourselves. Jesus Christ kept the law perfectly on our behalf and guides us to love him and our neighbor. And if you hadn't guessed, the, the regular is the law and the bold is the gospel statement. So our Bible verse and truth, love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart, Deuteronomy 11, 13, and may God guides and protects us. Finally, our learner goal, I can paraphrase God's intent for how his human creatures should love him and love one another. All right. Oh, and I forgot I added this too. Our identity and calling. This is all part of the curriculum that uh, I figured it's beneficial for you guys to probably see. Yeah. So who am I? God has made me his creature, created to love him and serve my neighbor. And why am I here? I have been created to follow God's will, to love him and serve my neighbor. And these are all things that are on that handout. Um, so if you want to go home and continue conversations, that information is all on that handout. So as we're getting ready, we are outside, or when out, when are outside constraints to your actions helpful? When are they harmful? When are outside constraints to your actions helpful? Let's start there. Probably most of the time. Probably most of the time. Okay, that's fair. You know, I was thinking, um, when you're when you're thinking bad about other people, because that behavior isn't helpful, right? So it's good to have outside constraints. Um, so the the hurricane that came through. Hurricane Sally, you know, there was the, they were working on the Pensacola Bay Bridge, which is a mile long, you know, over the bay, and they were 
making it bigger, expanding it, whatnot. And there was a crane on a barge that wasn't tied up properly. And when Hurricane Sally came through, it took that barge right into the new bridge. And so that got me thinking, A, building the bridge, it's probably good that there are outside constraints put upon the people who are engineering and building that bridge. And then B, it would have definitely been helpful if the outright outside constraints were properly secured so that crane didn't knock into that bridge and take out sections of it. Um, and that, I mean, I think that shows, it speaks a good image. When we have bad thoughts towards other people, it affects our behavior. And we're like that crane that just demolishes what's in its path. Or like Kurt said, most times. <laughs> you know, when don't we have sin infecting our lives? Um, yet, when are they harmful? Can outside constraints be harmful? Yeah, you might take action against somebody. You might take action? Yeah. If you feel strong towards somebody, you might do something to hurt them. Did I say helpful? I meant hurtful. Sure. When are they hurtful to constrain those outside constraints? Because that's what that's when they're helpful to keep you from hurting someone. Keep you from hurting someone. Yeah. Did you When the government says you can't worship God, yeah. that is a hurtful outside restraint. Burn match. I'm not going to repeat that. <laughs> when you live in an area where they don't allow you to worship God. When you live in an area where they don't allow you to worship God. Um, how about when the laws or the constraints are directed against someone? in an unhealthy way. You know, we're talking about racism in our, in our society. Um, there was a time where the laws were harmful. You know, harmful towards certain individuals. Uh, all right. Any other thoughts? but I think we'll be discussing it as we go through. All right, so Exodus 20, verses 1 and 2. Does someone want to read? And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. All right. So before we get to the reflection question, we, we just heard God speak, I am the Lord your God. Last time we talked about the Exodus, and we talked about how they were pinned against the sea, right? And they were afraid for their lives, <laughs> even though they had just witnessed the plagues. Even though they had just witnessed the plagues, even though they're being led by a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night, they're, they're afraid. So... God tells Moses, stretch out your hands. They walk through on dry ground. Pharaoh's army is, is crushed, defeated in those waters. And they have seen God's salvation. And they start wandering, um, coming towards Mount Moriah, Mount Sinai. Okay, Mount Sinai. And what do they immediately start doing? Anybody know? Whining. Whining, again. You had just seen the plagues. You had just been delivered from Pharaoh's army through the sea. We're thirsty. We want something to drink. Moses, we're hungry. Oh, my. Why can't you get it through your head? So, of course, God gives them water. He gives them food, as we know God will do. And then finally, he brings them here. And he says, look, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. So what does God's introduction to the Ten Commandments reveal about him? And how does this apply to God's command that we should love him and our neighbor? He expects us to follow his rules. 
He ex okay, he expects us to follow his commandments, but why? Out of love. Out of love. Because are these commandments going to be helpful to us or harmful to us? Helpful. I brought you out of the land of Egypt. I brought you out of slavery. My desire is to give you forgiveness and life. Therefore, listen to me. Listen to the words I'm about to speak, right? Any other thoughts? This wasn't just a bad character. This was the people of Israel. Absolutely. So what does it say about how we should... Oh, yeah, Tony. So in this moment of time, God is speaking to the people of Israel. Yet is he revealing anything different to them that he desires for all humanity? No, because we know he desires our life. He desires our freedom. Freedom from sin. Not freedom to do as we please, but freedom from sin. Freedom from death. Freedom from Satan. Pastor, I've often wondered, just what did the people of Israel expect when they left Egypt? I mean... I have no idea. <laughs> they wanted away from slavery, but to what? I mean, what did they yeah. think? Well, and so I think that's a good question, though, because how often are we... Okay, we're set free by Christ, but for what? To what are we set free to? Um, I don't know what their expectation is. Um, maybe a life of well, ease. Well, they didn't take long to start whining and want to go back. Yeah. That's true. I mean, they, they are on the other side, and I believe they mention again, after they see Pharaoh's army destroyed, they mention again about how, oh, we had all the food we wanted back in Egypt. That's, that's self-deception, is what we call it. When, when, they, me, yeah. they were, when they were in the slavery, somebody was doing the thinking for them. Right, and right. They had to think for themselves. Right, right. That's different. Thinking for yourself is difficult. And if you're freed from bondage to sin, Thinking rightly can be difficult. That's why Christians are not called to be out on their own. Christians are called to be in the church. Yeah. Well, I wonder if, you know, we look at that and we think they were probably rejoicing that they were free from slavery and so forth. But you know, the minute they stepped into that Red Sea and their Dry ground, mm -hmm. then I think they begin maybe to be frightened again. Yeah. Because at least in Egypt they knew what to expect. They knew what to expect. And now they're, Someone else thought they're for them. stepping off into the unknown. It's new, it's scary, it's different. Yeah. And so I don't know if they knew what to expect. I don't know if they had any expectation. Um, probably, I'm assuming, though, a life of ease and comfort and all that jazz. Well, the land flowing with milk and honey is what they wanted. 
Right, sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Yeah, how did they know something better was coming? Did they go on blind faith, or did they have some way to know that they could live better or different? Um, I mean, they did. They, they knew the promised land. You know, and they knew Moses was taking them to the promised land. So they knew the promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God told Moses, tell them, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that I will bring them to their prom the promised land. So, um, that took blind faith to believe in what he was telling them because they didn't actually know it. Well, yeah. They didn't know him very well, did they? They just knew the promise. They knew the stories that were handed down over the last 400 years um, about God. They knew what slavery was. They knew what slavery and was. Them. And they knew they wanted out. Yeah. Which, I mean, think about that. Did they really go of their own free will? They knew they wanted out of slavery. And the only way to do that was to listen to God and follow Moses. They didn't have a lot of choices. No, and then we talked about at the sea, they were afraid, and, and the angel stood between them and Egypt. Maybe we'll finish. Stood between them and Egypt to, to guard and protect, and there was this hedge placed around them but not only was that, that protection there to protect them from Pharaoh and his army, but we also mentioned, did they have any choice to go anywhere but into the, into the sea? No. God literally hemmed them in. There was no way for them to go except into the sea. They, oh, heck no, they wouldn't have survived on their own. <laughs> I think they proved that. Um, so that is why God is making this important declaration. Oh, this important declaration. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You know, I am the one who has provided for you. I am the one who has shown you the way to go. I am the one who has directed all of your steps. I am the I am. Therefore, listen to me. And we haven't quite got to this, um, the second question. How does this then apply to how we should love our neighbors. Because who are our neighbors? Why is it bad for us to hurt our neighbor? Perhaps everybody. Yeah. And why is it bad for us to harm them? Why do we need constraints against it? Because they are God's children. They were created by God. God desires to redeem them too from sin, death, and the devil. That means even your own sinful actions that bring death to another, he constrains. Not because he wants to be a party pooper, but because he loves us and desires that we all have life and have life abundantly. So Exodus 23 through 6. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth below or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. And so this is right after the first commandment, but in our catechism we talk about this as, as 
the close of the commandments. You know, what, what does God have to say about all these commandments? But this long section is known as the first commandment, or the command through which all the rest flow. What do you think it means that God is jealous? And have no other gods before him. Okay. He won't share your attention with anything else. He won't share your attention. No other gods before him. What does this mean? We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Why is God jealous for you? Why does he not want to share his glory with any idol or anything else? Pastor, my footnote in, in that section says uh, this was not sinful jealousy, but a righteous desire for his people to be faithful. Right. And why? It's because he made because us. He loves us. Because he made us, because he loves us. And what happens if we don't listen to him? Death. Sin runs rampant. Suffering runs rampant. Evil runs rampant. Death. Do false idols have any power to save you at all? No. No. God is jealous for you because he alone can give you life. Therefore, he wants you to be in him that he may give you life and you have it abundantly. God is a God of life. This is a phrase that the confirmants are learning well from me. God is a God of life. He goes back to Adam and Eve even because God wanted them to follow him and to follow his rules. Right. Right. And said, Hi, guess what? Here's an apple. Well, the, the outside restraint was the law of don't eat from this. And, and Luther talks about, you know, every time that Adam and Eve walked by that tree without eating it, they worshipped God because they were honoring his word. And then the temptation came to ignore that outside restraint. And that's when things went haywire. Because was God holding out on Adam and Eve? We talked about this. Was God holding out on Adam and Eve? As Satan, as Satan said he was, there's a clue. Knowledge of good and evil. Yeah, what was he protecting them from? Evil. Evil. Was God holding out on them? No. They only knew good. They only had life. They were completely innocent and ignorant of death and suffering and pain and everything that comes with sin. Right where he wanted paradise. They were in paradise, in harmony with God, in harmony with creation. And then sin came and kind of flipped that all on its head. You know, on a real personal day-to-day level, it's, it's like when our kids are doing something we don't want them to do, and, and we're trying to keep them from, uh, from you know, experiencing the pain. Right. No, know it's coming. Right. Fatherhood has taught me a lot <laughs> about God. You haven't seen anything yet. Oh, um, I know it's coming. <laughs> but, but, I mean, you do know those moments when, as a parent, You see your kid and you're so frustrated because they won't listen to you, but you're doing it because you don't want them to get hurt. And then of course they don't listen to you and they get hurt and you still love them anyway because the point wasn't, okay, it's my will, not yours. The point was I had this rule for you because I didn't want you to get hurt. And that's exactly what the Ten Commandments are. Um, So he's a jealous God because he loves us and he wants to protect us even from ourselves. 
Uh, okay. Wait. <laughs> so what does this show us about his desire to live? Okay, I think we kind of talked about it. Exodus 27 through 11. The second and third commandments finished off what we call the first table of the law. Um, those, those first three commandments that deal with our relationship to God or how we should love God. So why do you think these two commandments, the second and third, are so important to God when our culture tends to treat them so lightly? Yeah. Oh, we'll solve it right now. <laughs> well, it says, I am the Lord your God, do not take my name in vain. Mm -hmm. Okay. In vain. Does that mean you uh, trip over a rock and fall down and you say, oh, God. Or is that in vain? Or if the hurricane strikes New Orleans and you say, oh, my God, look at that. Mm -hmm. What's the difference? Mm -hmm. Are they both in vain, or one in vain, or one not? So, taking something in vain means, basically, to render it impotent because it's being used wrongly, right? So a vain promise is you're making an empty promise because you're promising something you shouldn't. So taking God's name in vain is to use it in a way that God never gave it to be used. So did God, you, did God give his name so that when something happens, we could say, oh, my God. Is that the purpose of his name? No. Whether it be falling on a rock or you're falling over a rock and skinning your knee or seeing the devastation of a hurricane. What would be an appropriate use of his name in those instances? God help us. Yeah, praise him. Thank him. Ask him for help. The second commandment, Luther explains, we should fear and love God so that we do not curse, swear, use satanic arts, lie or deceive by his name, but call upon it in every trouble. Pray, praise, and give thanks. So not only is it, is it tripping and, and hurting yourself and saying, you know, what have you, but it's also, especially using his name wrongly in teaching the faith. So is it any worse when someone says, oh, I received this message from God and here it is. He gave it to me in a dream. And no, I haven't checked with scripture. And I really don't care what scripture says because I know God said this to me. Is there any difference between that and using his name as an explicative? No. Because you are not using his name properly. We are known by our names, right? God is known by his name. If they ask me who sent me, what should I say? Say the I am has sent you. The God of Jacob, of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. His name is who he is. His name is put on us in baptism. His name is put on us every time we come for worship. So his name has the power to save. There is no other name under heaven or earth by which we are saved. Therefore, 
we are to use his name rightly and speak truthfully about his name that people may know who he rightly is. Does that make sense? So I know that went a little farther, but I hope that kind of fleshed Exactly how you should be using it. Right, my God, my God, why have you forsaken? Right, and this is—we're not going to get through all this. This is why you, uh, the the Pharisees and, and the tradition of the Pharisees and, and others—they eventually stopped using God's name because they were afraid they were going to use it in vain. But by doing so. They were using God's name in vain because he gave it for us to use. And so the fear of breaking the second commandment shouldn't prevent us from using his name. Because Christians, we know, if we, if we do use his name in vain, what do we do? We ask for forgiveness. We say, Lord, I, I recognize, I understand that I used your name in vain. I am so sorry. Please forgive me and help me to use it rightly. Make sense? All right. Um, so let's see if we can finish answering this question. Uh... So what about the third? We talked about the second commandment. What about the third? Let's at least finish the third, talking about the third commandment. You know, why is it so important? Second commandment is important because it's through his name that he is known. But what about the Sabbath day? Why is the Sabbath day significant? So we can show respect and love to God, right? We come here not on the Sabbath day, but on the Lord's day. The Sabbath is Saturday, but we come on Sunday because that's the day Christ rose, because we understand that God is not interested in, in dictating. He's interested in giving us life. So it's not about Saturday. It's about coming and praising and honoring because we do so in response to what? What do we receive from him here? God is a God of life, right? We receive life from him here. Whose hands do we often put ourselves in the care of. That's who we should. <laughs> That's who we should. Who do we think, though, is the one who's going to take care of us? So God commands, there is a day in which you shall rest so that you may know and understand and realize and appreciate who is the one who takes care of you. God. Our rest is in him. On Saturday, on the Sabbath, Christ rested in the tomb. If you haven't been to, to, the, to the Easter vigil, you know, you might not have thought of that before. Saturday, Christ rested. The seventh day of the week, the Sabbath, Christ rested from all of his labors in the tomb. He said on Friday, 
as he died, it is finished. The week of new creation is finished. And on the seventh day, he rested in the tomb. And on the eighth day, the first day of the new creation, he rose again from the dead. And since then, we have been living half in the old creation, half in the new creation. Because we come here to receive his word and his sacrament, because in them we have life. All right, before I make us too terribly late, I'll figure out what to do with the rest of this. Because in order to stay on track with everybody else, we will have to move on. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you've given us your word. Help us to receive and understand that your law was given to us because you desire life. Your desire and fervent plea is that we listen to you, that we may have life and share it with those around us. Please help us to, to look at your external constraints that not only may we not sin, but that we show your love and mercy to all of those who do not yet know you. It is in Jesus' name that we fervently pray.